Welcome back. Back in the audio saddle, and I'm talking about mixing techniques for hardcore rock and roll. I think hardcore is uh, very appropriate because uh, the example I'm going to be using today is none other than Under Oath. All right, I'm just going to stop it right there. We'll, we'll get to every part of the song, but let's just talk about this verse. I mean, this verse is crazy. Verses in music are generally the part of the song where you're kind of maybe pulling back a little bit with the instrumentation to make room for the verse vocals, right? Well, no, not when you're an under oath. When you're an under oath, this is the drum part that you come up with for the verse. I mean, it's double time at 165. So <laughs> it's just the drumming on this song is incredible. It's not only just the parts that are written, but the way he attacks it. It's just, he's a monster. And to top it all off, he sings at the same time live. This is more like almost a drum solo in the verse here, but it just creates this intense cacophony. The challenge as the mixer for this song is how do you actually make that all fit together? How do you have a drum solo in a verse where you have lyrics going on? Obviously, the first thing you need to do is get a really good slamming drum sound. Here, here's the drum kit. It's actually not that many tracks. In a lot of hard rock, there is a technique that is used, drum triggering. So here is the printed KA kick sample. Where did I get my trigger source? I got it from this track. I think it's a kick in mic. The audio of this is not going to appear in the mix. I'm just trying to create it a nice solid trigger source. So again, here's the untreated and then here is just a simple expansion just making sure that those snares aren't too loud we just want to make sure the kick is the only thing that's popping the trigger on the trigger plugin i know there's a few of different solutions for drum triggering out there this is just one i've been using for a long time I have a few libraries for it. I'm used to it and it works really good. Steven Slate Trigger 2. So you can see it's where it's picking up all the uh, triggers from the acoustic track. It's getting them all. I'm not hearing any false triggers. It sounds like the pattern to me. For this song, I needed something with a brighter attack. This is where I ended up. AC kick. Here's that AC kick printed as audio on my kick sample track. And then the SSL uh, channel again, almost nothing on EQ, just a little bit of sub roll off, a little bit of mid range roll off, some noticeable compression, bypassing again. I do have some drum room that I am applying, which you can see I'm actually applying it to most of the close mics. And that drum room is being supplied by my new favorite room simulation plugin. This is the Sunset Sound IK Multimedia Studio Reverb plugin. I know these rooms, I've worked in all three of them, and this plugin is literally like having the ambience of those actual live rooms. We've got Studio One, Studio Two, and Studio Three, and they all have a different quality to them. Here's Studio Three. Studio 2. Studio 1, I believe, 
is where the first two Van Halen records were recorded. I just love it. It sounds like those rooms. They've shot an IR, an impulse response of these rooms, and put it in a plugin for a hundred bucks. I mean, I just... The other crazy part of this plugin is that for each of the studios, you get four elements. You don't just get the live room, you also get the ISO booth. Um, so you've got the sort of bigger rooms, the ISO booth, and then each studio also has its own chamber. A chamber is a room with hard surfaces and a speaker in it, and you send whatever audio you want to that speaker, and there's microphones in there to pick up sound bouncing around in that room. That is how people used to, and still do, create a flavor of reverb a chamber reverb. I tend to be longer. There's the speaker in Studio One's chamber. That's the actual speaker that's piping the sound into the room. Studio Two. And then you also get the plate for each room. You had your chamber reverb, you had your plate reverb. Here's the plate for Studio One. Studio two. And a spring reverb, I guess, from Studio three. I love the simplicity of the interface. I love the images they show you. There's some EQ available down here, some width controls, but in general, I just put it on a send, turn off the dry, make sure the wet's up all the way. I'm sending uh, different drum mics to it. Okay, so that's kick drum, snare top, SM57. Sounds like a 57 on a snare. I'm not brightening it a whole lot because I see further down the track list here that I've got a snare bottom. So let's put those two together. And I'm flipping the face on the bottom mic. Here's it unflipped. You can see how thin that sounds. And there's the body comes back. Matt Squire, being the awesome producer that he is, provided me with a snare trigger track. I could do that myself, but I found his trigger sound to be great. Super fat, beefy. Let me turn off my ambience and my processing. What's great about this, from my point of view, is that there's hundreds of snare hits in this song, and he saved me so much time by going through and making sure every one of those hits is real and not a miss hit, and there are no missed hits as well. So thank you, Matt. I really appreciated that. Here is what I'm doing on the channel strip for the snare trigger. Let's turn it off again. I'm doing a lot of brightening. SSL is one of those companies, musicians designed a lot of their consoles and circuit designs. And so the default positions that you find these knobs to be in are not there by coincidence. They've been picked. And so a lot of times, if you just want something brighter, you just pull this thing up, leave this where it was. 3.5, leave this where it is, 8, and you just start boosting. A lot of times, just within a few dB of boost, you're like, there we go, that's it, that's what I wanted. You don't even have to go in and, and find the quote-unquote right frequency, because they kind of already knew what it was. One thing about the way this dynamic section works is that it has sort of like automatic gain leveling. So what I do a lot of the time with this particular compressor, I just whack the threshold all the way up and then wind in the amount of compression by controlling the ratio. So there's no gain reduction. I'm just slowly winding that in. And you see that the level really hasn't changed. But what has changed is I'm getting a thicker, kind of thuddier impact. Here's just the two mics, top and bottom. And here's adding in the snare trigger. And here's taking out the, the original mics. So it, this is not a replacement. This is an augmentation. There's a lot of performance in those mics. 
that is lost when they're when they're not there. Adding back the reverbs that I have on the snare trigger. So I got some room going on there. But I also have this thing that I call snare verb. And what is that? Well, it's a gated reverb. Just to pop that snare out in the mix just a little bit more. So what are we doing? It's an altiverb with an IR of an AMS RMX 16. I'm using the nonlinear, which is gated. Here's the snare trigger with just some dynamics and a little bit of EQ. And then here's adding just the snare verb from altiverb. And then I've got the sunset sound room on there as well. So the two together sounds like you're in the room with the snare drum. Moving down to the toms. In a song like this where we've got a lot of hits on the drums and the cymbals, stripping out the toms or gating the toms, toms can be pretty dynamically hit sometimes. So you can have trouble getting a gate setting to work for every hit in the song. And because there's only a few hits on the toms in general in a song, it's actually more efficient and sounds better, in my opinion, to simply go in and manually cut out all the non-tom hit information. You can see and hear how much stuff there is. on these tom tracks that isn't toms. That's where this uh, stripping technique comes in. So yeah, you can see that there's like a pretty quick fade at the end of the hits. And then here is the channel processing on the rack tom, which looks to be simply a 500 cut. Floor tom. Floor tom tends to have more cymbals on it than rack tom. Just by the nature of where it's placed, there's usually a crash and a ride closer to it than the rack tom. So you're fighting bleed on floor tom mics more than rack toms in general. Tiny bit of brightening at 3K. Another 500 cut and a little bit more low end cut than I did on the rack tom because sometimes you can get that kind of flubby, sus subby sustain on floor toms. Overheads, big part of a drum kit. And these ones sound awesome. I mean, you can hear everything he's playing. Not doing much. Another little cut at 500 and 0.7 dB at 8K. Very finished sounding overheads to me. Thank you, Matt. Room. Rolling off a tiny bit of high end. I tend to do that sometimes on room mics because, again, cymbal control. Actually, it's a pretty nice balance between kick, snare, and crashes. Um, the crashes are a little dominant. Now the hall. Sounds like a microphone in the hallway of the studio. So this is everything except the, am the straight up ambient mics. This is just overheads and close mics on the drums. And as you can tell, we have a fairly decent uh, blend already of the kit. Room mic, hall mic. Pretty low. Just adding a little bit of confusion in the background there. What do we got here? We've got a trash mic. What is a trash mic? It's an ambient mic, but it doesn't set and like it's too far away from the kit. It's just like a flavor to blend in. I'm using it. Uh, this is with it. And that's without it. Now, I know <laughs> it might be kind of hard for some people to hear the differences there, but there's a thrust in the mono space that this mic is providing. I'm not sure where it was placed, but not a whole lot of symbols in it, which is great. It just lends another level of kind of like solidity to uh, the picture that you're painting of the drum kit. Love the trash mic. Thank you, Matt. And then there's something called Neil, like the name Neil. I'm not sure what that refers to, but this is what it sounds like. 
Sounds like this uh, was, and looks like as well, pretty heavily limited track. What am I doing to it? I'm cutting out the top because there's too much uh, hashy cymbals up there. That's gonna cut into the top of the guitars. Now that's gonna create a lot of problems downstream. So I lopped off the top end here with a low pass filter. And that's really all I did. Just cut off the top and eased it in to my drum kit blend. So let's hear it off. And on. A lot of times what I'm trying to do with these kind of mono ambient mics is to create more body in the kit. And so I find myself lopping off that top end right off the bat and just trying to get the thud and the impact of the drums because I already got the cymbals. And all of the drum mics and those effects are routed into my drum kit bus. And you can see I've got an automation lane and I'm doing some moves pretty subtle once the song gets going but let's talk about the processing on the drum kit vmr talked about this in the crow's eye series the aim of this is to make it sound like your audio is passing through a console and adding some mojo to it what i'm doing here is obviously really subtle just a couple db of harmonic drive probably will have a hard time hearing that Let's add in a little something. Down to my beloved C4, I know Waves made a C6, which is sonically superior. And if I was starting right now uh, and had both the C6 and C4 available, I would pick the C6 and I would embrace that. Unfortunately for me, I've been using C4 for so long, I know how it works, I know how it sounds. I'm able to get it to do what I wanna do quickly. And there's nothing wrong with that. You don't have to migrate to the latest and greatest piece of software every time one is released. If it sounds good, it is good. Not working too hard. That's a little bit of cymbal control above 5K. A little bit of low end, low mid and low end control. But very little really. This is just like a more of a, a subtle lockdown. But I am actually boosting a little bit of the lows and low mids. Here's about the C4. I don't know what it is about the C4. It just does something to drums that I love. It's not just that it's controlling those bands, but it adds a certain amount of punch. I don't know. I like what it does. The big compressor on the drum bus is the FET compressor by Softube, which is an 1176 type of gain circuit. It was one of the first FET style plugins that had the parallel inject function, which is a blending knob between the uncompressed sound and the compressed sound that it is creating. So you can see here that I am leaning towards the uncompressed sound a little bit, but the compressed sound that is coming through is quite compressed. So let me click it all the way to dry. We'll wind in or blend in the uh, compressed signal. Another instance of VMR, the virtual mix rack, but instead of having the console emulation in there, I have Slate Audio's version of a Neve EQ. And what I love about this EQ is it is so edgy and bright and cutting. A lot of times when I'm looking at my settings, the amount of boost I'm using is really small because it's quite noticeable. Just a very subtle high mid and, and high boost. It's very, very subtle. Another level of EQ. Probably searching for the snare here a little bit. Mm -hmm. 
So you might be asking yourself, well, why didn't I just do the boost on the previous EQ in the chain? Well, the reason is I probably started to, but then it got maybe a little harsh. And so I went to a more neutral sounding EQ to continue my high end boost. Then I have a couple different analog tape emulation plugins at the end of the chain. I mean, I've got seven plugins just on the drum kit bus. So let's bypass this and see what it sounds like. What I love about this plugin on drums is it just adds all this fatness to your drum hits. It doesn't really roll off any high end. It does definitely boost the low end. So here we have another window you can drill down into and control the bass alignment, which is essentially like a bass EQ knob. So I have lowered that by a half a dB. To me, like the snare just gained... Oh, just gained all this dimension kind of in thickness. You know, as you move along, you're like, wow, I actually need to compress the drums even more to compete with the rest of the instruments. A lot of times I find myself reaching for this plugin because it does compress and saturate, but it tends not to bring up the cymbals. Just trying to darken it, but make it just a little more chunky. Percussion. What do I have in the percussion bus? There seems to be uh, an intro and a bridge, whether it's some additional overdub drums. Like a marching snare, some toms. Uh, we do have this other bridge section. But the other thing that's in the percussion is these 808 drops. So those are not meant to be heard, they're meant to be felt. Oh yeah, they're there. Those are tricky because the sub information in, in these 808 drops is mighty. If they're too loud, they're going to trigger the, the limiting on the stereo bus compressors like this guy over here. And then what you have is essentially the whole mix goes down in level in the exact spot where you want it to go up. So you have to be careful that they're, they're not hitting the compressors downstream too hard. That wraps up the drum kit and the percussion. Let's jump into bass guitar. Pretty minimal bass guitar group. We have one track of bass. Sometimes you end up going back to the DI and using an amp sim plug-in like this because the recorded amp sound, you're having issues with it. It's not sitting right with the drums. It's hard to hear the part. Whatever it is, I don't do this all the time. Sometimes I do this with the DI and also use the recorded amp sounds. But in this particular case, just use the DI with this amp sim. I'm going to turn off everything on the bass DI track so you can hear just the DI. So it's pretty good. And here is what I'm doing with the UAD Ampeg SVTR amplifier modeler plugin. There's the DI. I just have to say for bedroom recordists and you record bass or you have bass parts in your music, I highly, highly recommend this plugin. This plugin sounds like the amp. You've got an entire list of different speaker configurations here. I picked this one, but there's many others. I mean, the 810 sounds like the 810. Then you get to the 115, very different sound. 2dB of power soak, which is basically just lowering the output in this particular plugin is called power soak. Doing some pretty radical EQ up here. For instance, I've got the treble all the way up. 
There's the treble at five or nominal. Not enough attack there for this song. There is another uh, high-end boost called Ultra High. Let's put this at five and engage Ultra High. Pretty cool, pretty cool. But it's boosting a higher frequency. I'm guessing it's above four or five K, whereas this treble sounds like it's more in the mid range to me. And in this particular instance, I didn't want that. It's just, this sounded a little too much like corn to me. And I don't think these guys are corn, got kind of their own thing. So I left ultra high off and I chose to boost the treble knob. boosting some mids, not boosting too much bass. The volume gives you kind of your amount of distortion and volume as well, of course. But if you want a little bit more grit and more compression, you can turn it up. On this bass sound, the more I wind in this volume, the more I don't hear that string noise that I like. I've got a C4, of course I do. Doing a lot of low end control here. Not so much that I want to lower the low end, but I want to even it out so you can see how it's working harder on certain notes. After the C4, we have a decapitator. This is a distortion plugin by Sound Toys. Put a few of these on a few tracks. It makes it sound like everyone's playing uh, with bleeding fingers. Distortion can be your friend on bass and hardcore mixing for sure. Bass and drums working pretty good. So I got the basic tone that I want now, but I do have one effect I would like to add, room ambience. And I'm doing that again with my new favorite room plugin. Sunset Sound from IK Multimedia. It's kind of like you're emulating a, a real studio, right? You, you put the bass in the ISO booth or, you, or some booth. You can't just have it out in the main room with the drums. It'd be too much bass on the drums. So where would you normally put it? You'd put it in an ISO booth of some kind. So we've got an ISO booth. I have selected Studio One's ISO booth. Let's wind that in and see what it sounds like. if you've ever stood in a small room with a bass amp that loud, but that is what it sounds like. Those short reflections. I love how it makes a little stereo. All right, so we have covered the drum kit, percussion, and bass guitar. And that's probably a good place to end this episode, but don't worry, I'm working on at least two more episodes on mixing under oaths on my teeth, and I will be walking you through my mix processes for guitars, keyboards, vocals, and the stereo bus in those upcoming episodes, so make sure you are subscribed. Oh, and one more thing. I will be posting an invitation video very shortly 